Welcome to the University of California, San Francisco Sports Medicine Podcast, featuring Dr. Nero Fundia, Dr. Brian Feely, and Dr. Drew Lansdowne, discussing hot topics in sports medicine and society. All right. All right. Welcome to the UCSF Sports Medicine Podcast, six to eight weeks with myself, Dr. Nero Fundia, Dr. Brian Feely, and Dr. Drew Lansdowne. Drew is in the OR right now, so it's going to be me and Brian. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Neeraj Patel who is at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, part of Northwestern University. We are one of two bald pediatric orthopedic Indian surgeons uh, in the country. So um, welcome, Manaraj. Thanks for joining our podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Re really appreciate it, guys. So um, maybe you can just start out just for our audience. Tell us a little bit more about your path to orthopedic surgery and then particularly uh, into, into pediatric orthopedic, orthopedic surgery and sports medicine. What, what brought you there? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I think... Um, the the initial impetus was to go into medicine right and and i was one of those kids who like at a young age enjoyed kind of like sketching anatomy things in my notebook and that sort of thing so i was always kind of fascinated with just like sort of how the body works and that sort of thing right so um from a young age i kind of had an idea that that's what i wanted to do um ultimately um ended up getting into medical school um i took a little bit of a circuitous route um and and you know i, I always put it as like a a little bit of a, a, a tale of uh, someone who maybe didn't make it the first time, right? So the first time I actually applied to medical school, zero interviews. I still to this day cannot understand why. Um, so I had to kind of regroup, you know, uh, went to grad school for a little bit, was in the military for a little bit, did some of those things, and then reapplied and got in, thankfully. Um, and then during uh, medical school, got interested in orthopedics, just kind of by chance. I was just kind of putting the feelers out and seeing. And uh, the more I learned about the field, the more I liked. I think having somewhat of a sports background, no, not high level by any means, um, as well as a, a military background and dealing with uh, soldiers' injuries and things like that, and healthcare, um, I had a, I developed an interest in just kind of structure and function, um, especially especially musculoskeletal structure and function and the impact that injuries and other problems can have on somebody's life and and function, and so um, that kind of drew me in deeper. And then I had the uh, the the fortunate um, opportunity to to spend a year during medical school, between my third and th fourth year of medical school, to spend a year at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, doing a research year with uh, Jack Flynn and Ted Gamley over there. Um, and uh, they, they kind of took a chance on me uh, and, and I spent the year down there and I kind of saw pediatric orthopedics for the first time, but instantly fell in love with it. Loved working with kids, loved seeing the sort of interactions of these amazing docs with the families, with the children and the difference that they're able to make. Um, and so I was kind of hooked from there, uh, knew I wanted to go into pediatric orthopedics. And, um, and then as, as I continued training, the sports medicine part of it started to, to, to sort of factor in more as well. Um, I enjoyed working that patient population. I think I, I thought arthros arthroscopic procedures were, were, were kind of fun. Um, and the challenges were also interesting to me, uh, and pediatric sports medicine, when you combine those two things was a relatively new field, uh, as sort of, the semi-independent kind of line of work. And so. Um, from a research perspective, which is another thing that I was very interested in, in pursuing, there's a lot still to be figured out. So it was exciting to me to then potentially sort of ride this wave, uh, not to use a surfing analogy, you're, you're more the surfer than I am, um, but to ride this wave as we're just still just kind of taking off and, um, you know, kind of figuring th things out as a, as a young field. Um, so here I am today, um, now in Chicago and uh, trying to make some of those things happen. All right. I have so many questions for that. One, did you just describe Dr. Pandya as a surfer? Because that's awesome. <laughs> he has not made it out of the water without an injury yet, but <laughs> more power to you. Second, is this kind of a normal anatomy sketching or kind of a end of super bad scenario where your uh, middle school um, graph books would be confiscated in this day of age. No, no, this is this is this is very innocent stuff. You know, we're talking uh, GI system and skeleton Clearly. and stuff like that. All right, so, all right. Yeah, so I, I, kept, I kept a PG. I, I feel like you probably drew some worms, and now it's like, well, that was that was the lower intestine. I was pretty sophisticated. <laughs> I swear, I swear. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm not even going to mention James Harden and the beard. Um, <laughs> hey, I. I I started growing this before he got onto the nets, by the way. So I'm just going to put that out there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. I'm going to switch gears, uh, be much more serious. You know, obviously, you know, for me in orthopedic surgery, I look around and everybody looks like me. You know, we were just at a dinner where I look, where looking around 95% of the people in the room 
are essentially middle-aged to older white men. How is your experience being a person of color navigating orthopedic surgery in the interview process and especially early in your training and in your residency? How did you feel like that was different than some of your colleagues? Yeah, Brian, great question. I mean, I think, you know, as, um, as someone of South Asian descent, right, Indian, Indian American, uh, born in this country, but my, my parents and my sort of ancestry is, is all from, from India, um, you know, Nirav can relate certainly, and, and I'm sure you've got plenty more wisdom than I do on this, on this topic, but um, I think we, we, in America in general, occupy a very in interesting space, right? So uh, we're a newer community here. Um, we, we're not black, we're not white, you know, kind of where do we fit in? And that's been a, a constant, sort of question, I don't necessarily want to say struggle, but a constant question since we started appearing in this country in, in larger numbers. Um, and so I think when it comes to healthcare, similarly, we, we, we occupy sort of an interesting space, right? I mean, I think, I can't tell you the amount of times that I've had a, a family <laughs> come in and they're like, oh, hey, do you know, uh, are you related to a Dr. Patel in Tinley Park or something? And I'm like, no, man, you know? Um, and so even though we don't make up like, you know, 10% of the America's patient population or uh, America's population overall, we make up a, a very large amount of the healthcare uh, force in this country relative to our overall numbers, and uh, especially on the, on the physician side. So I think, you know, in, in a lot of ways, we're, we're overrepresented in medicine, if you really look at the numbers and you're strictly going by the numbers, um, yet we are a minority group overall. Um, and so it, it's just kind of an interesting, interesting space. So I, I would never you know, purport to say that I have been through or know firsthand the, the struggles of, of, you know, for example, Black or Latinx uh, uh, folks that are trying to, trying to get into medicine or get into orthopedics or that kind of thing, because I think that's a, it's a very different experience, a very different history. Um, yet at the same time, um, you know, and you're, you're a good looking guy, Brian, but I don't look like you <laughs> either, right? Like you kind of said, so, um, you know, we're, we're kind of stuck in the middle to some degree. Um, I think in, in a way it's, a, it's I, I kind of like the space that we occupy because, you know, I'm not sort of a complete unknown, if you will. Um, and there are people, I mean, quite literally that look like me, we're sitting on a call with one of them right now, right? And Nirav's kind of been been like a big brother to me, you know, since I started doing this and has looked out for me. And um, so there's, there's, that, there's that model, at least to some degree, right? You got uh, within pediatric orthopedics, there aren't a zillion sort of South Asian American pediatric orthopedists, but there are certainly a bunch. And I mean, the current positive president, for example, is Min Coker, right? Who everybody knows, but, uh, and respects. And, and so, you know, there's somebody there who looks like you. So I think, um, you know, a lot of what we talk about is uh, for, for, for students, especially coming up is, is having that, that mentor, that role model, that sort of vision. Oh, there's somebody that looks like me or that that's from where I came from that is able to do this, is able to accomplish that goal. And all of a sudden that becomes maybe a little more real to you. So I've been fortunate as an Indian American person or a South Asian American person to have those people to, to look up to my own parents, uh, you know, guys like Nirov and, and, and other folks in the field to, to, to show that, yeah, this can be done. This has been done, even if not uh, run to the mill at this point. So, but at the same time, you know, we still occupy that minority sort of space. So I think there is certainly there are certainly bridges that should and uh, should be built with other minority communities, people of color that are trying to, uh, that, that need to be more represented in medicine. So the black, Latinx communities and so forth. Um, and, and those are things that we've been actively trying to, to do over the last several years, whether it's the research or, you know, kind of advocacy or, or education or so forth. Yeah, I think you make a really good point about like looking around and seeing who is, who's around, who can be a mentor, who can be a role model. And certainly I think it's gotten somewhat better, but I remember you know, certainly when I was um, a med student, um, people from South Asian descent were not strong enough to do ortho and it wasn't right. mental strong enough. There was this um, fallacy that you needed to be physically a certain level of strongness that only came with being a looking like you played in the NFL and you were an offensive or defensive lineman. And I think as we've gotten somewhat better, like the stereotypes still persist that you have to be big and strong. And if you're of, of Asian descent or Southeast Asian descent, you're not gonna be physically strong enough. And we also see that with women that it's like, oh, well, she'll go into hand or she'll go into peds because they're just not strong enough. And it's, it's straight up not true. Right. Yeah, I, I think those stereotypes run deep, right? And, and, and it comes from the larger societal picture of, you know, women being the sort of meeker sex or whatever nonsense, right? Or, you know, traditionally, there's been that South Asian narrative of, oh, oh we're, we're the model, model minority, right? Because we are 
so smart and high achieving, but we're kind of docile and also, you know, like that kind of thing, which, uh, you know, <laughs> it's frankly not true. Um, so, so I think a lot of that is, is a larger societal issue of, of kind of breaking, breaking those stereotypes. Um, uh, and, and I definitely agree, Brian, I think things are, are for sure getting better. Uh, you know, the numbers kind of show that I think, right. If you look at the younger crop of orthopedic surgeons or the current residents, stuff like that, the demographics are definitely very different than the sort of later career orthopedists that are out there now. So it's hopeful, no question about it, but, um, you know, still work to be done. I was I was thankful. I'm thankful to be trained at a place. I, I trained at NYU uh, Hospital for Joint Disease in New York, and um, you know Joe Zuckerman has been the chairman there for, for or the chair, I should say, for a long time. Um, and and I he's someone I really respect because uh, uh, even sort of before it was not to say that it's just a fad, but even before it was the more popular thing to talk very openly about diversity and so forth uh, in residency, uh, he he had an eye to that. Um, and so I think we had a relative to orthopedics anyway uh, at the time a pretty diverse residency uh whether it's you know race ethnicity socioeconomic sort of background uh you know lgbtq that kind of thing so um you know it was nice to have be able to come up in that in that environment kind of shifting it over to the patient level i mean i one of the things that's you know obviously being talked about a lot now especially with vaccines and the nba you know talking about you know kind of historical um, you know, feelings towards the medical system is how do you deliver care that is compassionate and, you know, kind of culturally sensitive. Um, so what are some of the things that you found useful, particularly in Chicago, a very diverse patient population? I mean, we're describing a lot of procedures, particularly in peds, um, that a lot of people didn't do. Like you were 11, no one ever got their ACL done. So what are some of those things that you use strategies-wise, particularly in communities of color, to, to kind of build some trust in the healthcare system for the procedures that you're doing? Yeah, you hit on a great point. I mean, that that's so, so important. And I think it's something that we, that can easily be looked past, right? Because sometimes we get so focused on the technical aspect of what we're doing and the surgery, and this is what I'm going to do. And, you know, let's find a date and <laughs> kind of fix you up. Um, but that's so important, right? And so, uh, so I'll, I'll say one interesting thing that I learned about Chicago when I moved out here, which I didn't really fully uh, appreciate before, is that apparently, uh, by the numbers, Chicago, the Chicagoland area has the second highest Mexican American population in America to the LA area. Um, I had no idea until I, I saw that stat and I'm like, now it makes sense. I have so many families um, that uh, who the parents prefer speak Spanish, um, you know, and that kind of thing. And so, okay, now it makes sense. So I, I have a large chunk of, pop, uh, of patients um, whose parents aren't comfortable speaking English primarily. Um, and so that's one, and I'm sure you, got, you guys are in California, you, you have lots of experience with this too. Um, so I think that's, that's one area where immediately there's, there's that potential for that pitfall, right? Of that, that language barrier, that communication issue and stuff like that. So I think sometimes just going back to the basics, right? Number one, like use an interpreter, right? If, if it seems that the, the family is uncomfortable and sometimes also understanding beyond that, right? There, there's certain the families might, might feel stigmatized, right? Because they don't speak English uh, as well as, as maybe you do. Um, they, they may feel embarrassed to have to use an interpreter because they don't wanna let on that their English is not good enough or something like that. Um, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, we as physicians, as surgeons need to be able to look the patient in the eye and, and just tell, you know, make sure they, you impart to them that you care, that you're here to help them, that there's, it's essentially a safe space, right? There's nothing to be embarrassed about, nothing that they need to hold back. Um, use an interpreter and use the interpreter appropriately, um, you know, as they teach in medical school and, um, and get the information across as best you can that way. Um, I also, you know, it, it's tough because our, I don't know about your guys' practices, I'm assuming it's similar, and I'm sure you're way busier than I am, but, you know, we have 15 minute appointment slots, right? Regardless of what you're there for, new return, surgical, whatever, it's 15 minutes. So, um, you know, at some point I, I have to throw that out, to, out in the wind to some degree, right? If there's a new patient with an ACL tear that's coming from a challenging background where I think, you know, we got to take that little extra time to explain things and get the buy-in and, uh, and set up, you know, certain things for afterwards and whatever, then, hey, you know, my clinic's going to run a little late that day and I don't want it to, but it is what it is. Um, so I, I think, you know, those kind of things are important. Um, and then finally, you know, I think Again, I, 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 am, I am not black, I'm not Latino, right? But um, as a person of color, I think there is still often, from my experience, a certain, a certain uh, connection that's often there when uh, the patient, if the patient's a person of color, they see you and there's, there's a certain connection that's often there. 
Um, I've, I've had several patients who have seen other orthopedists elsewhere or whatever, um, and have been un, unsatisfied, uh, dissatisfied and then come. And um, I, I get the sense that it's largely like cultural essentially, right? And, and just kind of how you talk to them. Um, and so much, so much of this stuff is just basic communication, <laughs> right? So um, just understanding where this person comes from, which is hard to do when you meet them for the first time, but having that cultural awareness, right? And so then understanding how to speak to them and what might some of their, their concerns or uh, misconceptions be so I can address those things. Sometimes you just got to flat out ask it, right? Like, it's like, hey, you seem hesitant about X, Y, or Z, or like, you seem anxious about this, or like, are you nervous? Like, what's making you nervous? You know, and, and, and oftentimes they all start opening up to you once they see that you're there for their best interest. Yeah, I think it's a great point. Sometimes asking those one or two extra questions to understand why they're nervous as opposed to just like, yeah, going through step X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and kind of, you know, then just thinking about the actual surgery date, as you say, as opposed to like what their experience is. I think kind of an, another aspect of that as well, too, is how we, um, I think for the greater orthopedic community is how we report on these disparities or how we report on race or gender or socioeconomic status. So what are some strategies you think when orthopedic surgeons are doing research, you know, we're talking about you know, ACL techniques or shoulder stabilization techniques that we can utilize so that we can report on these things like you know where do you think that level of, of research needs to take place yeah and Nira, certainly you know thank you for asking that question but but you are certainly uh probably even more experienced researching some of that stuff than i am um so i i certainly respect that uh, i think there's plenty of work to be done on that front as well um and you know one of the one of the difficulties with the orthopedic literature as it stands is that traditionally a lot of it has been retrospective and um, you know, sort of, in, there's a lot of inherent limitations to that, um, especially when it comes to studying things like socioeconomic, socioeconomic status, uh, race, even gender, honestly, you know, with, with how we kind of understand it these days. Uh, it, it's hard to do that very meaningfully retrospectively, even though we're all sort of trying our best, you know, at, at, the, at the moment, it's sort of the best we have as we get prospective things going. Um, I think, you know, there's this question of like, should we ask race when we do studies and stuff like that? And you know, the, the whole question of what is race is a whole other, <laughs> you know, you can have a, an entire semester long course on that probably, right? Um, and so I won't belabor the point here, but um, I think in the, in the short term, yeah, I think it's useful to have that. Um, you know, what, what does it mean? What does it signify? Well, I think to me, that's a marker. Um, you know, we know that, that certain communities have been marginalized, disenfranchised and so forth throughout this country's history, right? So even if you say, well, race isn't a real thing, it's completely a social construct. That's true, but the people that experience the sort of repercussions of being classified into a certain race or so forth, uh, it, it becomes real, right? It becomes reified, as they say. So I, I think it is important to include those things in research. And then the question becomes, what is the best way to categorize those things? Because you know, one of the things that, that <laughs> sort of annoys me the most is uh, on the US census, right? There's race, there's ethnicity, and it becomes confusing, right? I, I know there's a lot of uh, 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 Latino and Latina folks that are like, where do I, you know, like, is my race other or is it white? Is it black? Then ethnicity, Hispanic, not Hispanic, like, where do I fit, you know? Um, because it's so complex. So I think reworking that categorization, it's never gonna be perfect, honestly, um, but I think that can help as well. And and the there was a, a group, the, the consensus, excuse me, the Census Bureau, um, piloted some changes uh, to the way those questions were asked by combining race and ethnicity to make it a little more straightforward and I think a little more practical. Um, and, I, and I really like that, but the last uh, uh, presidential administration uh, sort of nixed that when, the, when the, the actual census came out. So we still got the old thing, but I think that's, that's one important thing. As far as socioeconomic status and everything, there's, there's been improving work, I think, in different indices um, of, uh, of, of SES um, that are being used in, uh, in research now. Um, you know, previously we, we relied like on zip code or insurance status as like a proxy of that, which I th still think is important. Um, or, you know, if you could get like the median family income in that area or something like that, but those are all flawed in very different ways. So there's newer measures coming out now, um, indices that kind of combine a lot of these elements to make it a little more granular um, uh, to, to be able to kind of study that the socioeconomic status a little more meaningfully. The last thing real quick I'll add, you know, gender being another big sort of demographic thing um, that's important, I think, in research is, uh, you know, there's sex and there's gender, right? So, so that's another important thing. I think traditionally we sort of, especially with retrospective research, we kind of conflated the two, right? And it's like male, female. And um, 
it, with the discussion that's going on more broadly these days, I think we need to sort of you know move on with the times a little bit. And especially if we're doing prospective research at this point, um, you know, for example, near in the, in the trial that we're starting together, um, you know, there's a question for sex, but there's also a question for gender, right? And the, the patient is what who's answering that. Like that's not me based on a chart. Like the patient's answering it, so they can answer however they'd like. Um, and so I think all these things will be meaningful then ultimately for analysis, um, whether you're looking specifically for or at disparities or some other clinical outcome or whatever, I think it's important to have those things included and make sure you know exactly how you're going to use them. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. We have a couple of med students that are looking at distance traveled for shoulder replacement. And the data that they collect is obviously it's somewhat flawed. It's only from New York and, and um, Florida. Um, but they show that if you're black, you travel on average three times further, which doesn't seem like that big of a deal. It's like 35 versus 11 miles. And you think, well, that's not a big deal. But from a population standpoint, if you add that up, that's an insane amount of miles that you have to travel because for a variety of different reasons, either black people don't have access to the same care. They don't have access to, they're not comfortable with the surgeon that's close to them. So they, they feel like they have to travel further. And if you look at the sheer numbers of that, that's millions of miles traveled further for what should be something we're never even studying in the first place. Um, so I have, a, I have one last question that I think Nerev is gonna have to question the NBA jam and the NAT stuff. Um, what is your most frustrating st stereotype that you feel like comes up over and over again as a person of color in orthopedic surgery? Uh, that's a great question. And I don't know that I've ever been asked that before. So, so thanks, very, uh, very insightful. Um, you, you know, I, I think I, I've been fortunate again. I, I, I've trained in places that were diverse, that were very sort of conscious of these issues, um, that overall treated me very well. Um, and I had, I've had ex extremely uh, impactful mentors at each of these places also that have kind of opened doors for me and, and sort of pushed me forward. Uh, so I'm forever grateful for that. So thankfully, because of that, I, I haven't myself personally had to deal with a ton of uh, uh, kind of stereotype issues and that kind of thing. I think um, in, in orthopedic specifically, I think more broadly as a person of color, you know, we talked about, um, you know, South Asian American community, especially sort of stereotype as being that model minority, right? And so, um, you know, we kind of are supposed to be like, oh, well, every, all these Indians, oh, they're all smart. Wow, they're all doctors. Oh man, they're all rich, right? Um, and, and so that's, and then some, some people say, well, that's a good thing, right? So that's that's a, that's a good thing. You should be happy about that. Um, but what it does is that it's still a stereotype, right? It's a generalization and it's not actually accurate necessarily. Um, and and it, it, it has other implications as well, right? So, um, you know, by saying we're kind of like the good minority, then, well, who's who's the bad minority, right? So there's a little bit of that that sort of divide and conquer kind of situation going on there. So I think to me as a South Asian American, that's one of the things that I've tried to be most cognizant of, right? And, and, and the sort of space that I occupy in society and in orthopedics, but, but in society more generally, um, you know, not sort of falling into the trap of buying into that stereotype personally, and then potentially having myself used as like, oh, well, look, he's a brown guy who could do this. So why can't you do this? You know what I mean? Um, so I think that's, that's one of the things that I've, I've tried to be pretty cognizant of. Um, and just real quick on, on that model minority thing, right? I mean, it, the, the reason it exists, if you look at the immigration laws in this country, I mean, uh, the, the Immigration Act is 65, and I know I'm going on a little bit of a tangent here, so <laughs> bear with me, I apologize. But I think understanding that, you know, if we're talking about disparities and stuff, honestly, one of my biggest sort of beefs with the way these things are kind of talked about these days is, I don't know that a lot of people have a firm grasp of like the history, um, more generally of these things in this country, right? Like for the last several hundreds of years. So if you look at the Immigration Act of 65, you, if you're coming from South Asia, you had to be uh, professional, right? Like you had to have professional education and qualifications and everything like that. Otherwise you couldn't come here. So then, you know, all these folks start having families and so forth. And yeah, well, initially, sure, every Indian person you met was a doctor, but that's because it was planned to be that way, you know? Um, so anyway, I, I think there's a lot of that that needs to be undone um, so that, you know, my, my, my folks can build better bridges with other uh, communities of color. And then also, you know, as a broader society, kind of kind of come together and, and, and have a, a more equitable, equitable society. 
Well, uh, Niraj, thanks for thanks for joining us. What's your prediction for winning the NBA title this year? Assuming I mean, I got I got to go with my Nets. You know, um, this is this is the the best shot we've ever had, basically. I would say in our in our history. So, um, you know, I got to go with my Nets. But respect to the Warriors, I think you know if Clay comes back in any meaningful capacity, which I think he will, um, that's a that's a scary team out there. I mean, you guys are gonna be you guys will be good. As long as, as long as the Lakers don't win, we'll be happy. So. Exactly. <laughs> See, I knew we could bridge, bridge the gap. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot, Naraj. We appreciate you. Appreciate you having us. Thank you, fellas. This has been a pleasure. Okay, great. All right.